fascinated by the way we use technology and especially by the way teams create it. He's been through several startup journeys in Australia and in the US through his co-founder and he's even done a stint working with the Australian government as tech lead for the gov.au program. Currently he is VP of engineering at Expert360 and leads a team of 17 engineers. Dan has also spent several years exploring gender diversity issues in the industry and is co-producing a film entitled Debugging Diversity. So Dan, take it away. Cool, thank you. <clears throat> so first of all, I'm very conscious that I'm probably the last thing standing between you and either going to the bar or going home, so I won't take up too much of your time. Um, I should also mention this is a fairly high level talk. Um, I don't go into a whole lot of detail. There's kind of a lot to cover, so I'm sort of looking at it from a high level. Um, but if anyone wants to talk to me about some of the details or specifics, I'd be more than happy to, to chat afterwards. So why Expert360 chose an Elixir umbrella? Well, I wanted to start just by giving you a little bit of um, background on myself, my own journey that I've gone through, the different languages that I've used as a programmer and you know, maybe some of their foibles and, and um, nuances. Um, it started for me all the way back in 1994 when I was uh, started learning how to code using a, um, a programming language called QBasic. Anyone over probably the age of 30 or 35 may know that one. Um, couldn't even find a logo for it, that's how old it is. Uh, then I started, um, did a bit of ADA at Adelaide University. ADA was big because they were trying to find grads for Defence Force and um, then they dropped it after first year, so then I started learning Java. Um, did Java professionally for a while, um, dabbled in a few other C, C variants of languages. Obviously, JavaScript became a thing because I ended up in, in web development. And um, Ruby came along uh, in about the mid-2000s, uh, which became a real love of mine. It was not very fast, um, had all sorts of memory problems and multi-threading problems, but it was such a beautiful and easy language to use. More recently, I've started um, dabbling with Elixir, as you might imagine from the name of the talk, and of course Go, which is kind of the, the cool new thing amongst the, the hip kids of 2017 and 18. Um, and actually, I didn't even use PHP until just last year. I was really proud of never having coded a single line in PHP, and yet I fell off the horse when I needed to make a fix. Um, so there, I know PHP now. Um, why am I telling you this? Well, what I wanted to talk about was the way that technology trends in our industry, the way that people pick up different kinds of languages, different frameworks, and, and how they become popular. And actually, I, I uh, draw an analogy to a concept. Um, if you've ever, probably not many people uh, in this room maybe have, have studied marketing, but if you've ever um, learned a little bit about marketing, you might have heard of this idea of the technology adoption life cycle. Um, it was actually developed by a guy called Jeffrey Moore. No, not the CPU guy, the marketing guy. Um, and he called it crossing the chasm. So when a, when a technology becomes um, kind of mainstream, it, it, uh, it gets into this early majority curve. But in order for it to get to the early majority curve, it has to have gone through this process of breaking out. It sort of gets to that critical mass. Um, and in, in marketing and, and business strategy, there's a whole bunch of reasons. But in technology, we find that it's when you, you reach a certain number of people that start to use that technology, a certain amount of support, maybe it's in the open source community, maybe it's a certain number of kind of uh, corporations um, using it or contributing to um, documentation and so forth. Um, and I found it quite interesting to lay over some of those languages on, on this, um, this technology adoption curve. So um, it may not be a surprise to you that little old Ada is right down the other side. Uh, I don't know that many people are using Ada anymore, maybe a few laggards. Um, Java and PHP are still very popular, but they're certainly fading away, not fast enough in my opinion, but they are fading away. Ruby is probably just on the crest, about to start falling away now that other languages are becoming uh, more popular. I, I don't want to offend anyone, but maybe Python's there as well, don't know. Um, no, it hasn't sort of reached its peak yet, but might soon. This is an outlier, CoffeeScript. CoffeeScript never really made it to main, ado main uh, stream adoption, although there's some <laughs> hardcores that think it might still. So what does that mean for Expert360? When I joined Expert360 uh, just over a year ago, uh, there were eight members of the team. Um, there, were, uh, there was a huge amount of legacy, lots of PHP code, a little bit of Go code, uh, as they were trying to drag themselves out, uh, out of that mess. Um, there were 
thousands and thousands of contributions to that code base, it was a really big piece of crap, basically, that we had to try and unhook. Uh, and to give you an idea of how, how bad this was, um, just under 10,000 files, I guess for a, for a big code base it's not too bad, but these stats came from a service called Code Climb, and it's a static analysis tool, um, and it gives you a GPA out of four. GPA was 2.83, not so great, um, but 44,000 issues, or nearly 45,000 issues. That's security, potential security issues, uh, code smells, cyclomatic complexity, all that sort of stuff. Um, it was a really tough code base to work in. Um, so we thought, well, there's a guy, some of you may have heard of the guy called uh, Martin Fowler, Agile Luminary. He had an idea many years ago called the Strangler Pattern. So we know we've got this hunk of crap code that we need to get rid of. Rather than rewriting the whole thing and, and not actually delivering anything to, to stakeholders or customers for a while, um, we'll rewrite one thin vertical slice of it and let the core of it still continue. And the idea is that eventually you continue to add vertical slices and you strangle the thing and disappear. Um, it seemed like a really good idea and we started doing this. Um, we added some, some sort of new features as new applications and we stuck an Nginx proxy at the top there and we routed traffic to the right places depending on whether it was uh, new code or old. Uh, we switched away from MySQL because <coughs> it's shit. Um, but um, we ended up with some problems. Uh, seemed like, like I said, it seemed like a good idea. But just a little bit of um, kind of uh, teamwork theory to, to give you a sense of where I'm coming from. Um, has anyone seen this image before? If you've seen some of the, uh, the Spotify ways of working videos, they, um, uh, you may have seen this before. It's this idea of autonomy versus alignment. Um, and I was, I was very uh, motivated to give my team a high level of autonomy, but still maintaining alignment with uh, the organization goals. Um, as an example, if you look at the, the, the bottom left-hand corner here, if, you, if your team is not autonomous, so they don't have very much um, uh, control over what they work on, and you also have no alignment uh, with, say, management, basically people want to shoot themselves. Um, up in the top left-hand corner, it's sort of the militaristic view, the dictator, if you like. When management are, are setting a clear direction, it's really clear what we need to do, but no one gets to have any input in that. So that's a... Um, sort of not much better. You're making progress, but only for a short amount of time. You get high churn in teams and so forth because people crack the shits and leave. The bottom right is not any better either. That's chaos. When everybody has high, level of, high levels of autonomy, but uh, no alignment with, with what the business is actually trying to do or with each other. So the sweet spot is the top right-hand corner there. It's high autonomy and high alignment. Um, and I was trying to frame uh, my... I guess, team policies, if you like, my, uh, my team charter, as well as um, our technology strategy to support that goal. Uh, so we designed an architecture uh, to try and eradicate this, uh, this monolithic um, code base. Um, and I sort of thought, right, this is the alignment. I'm going to send this forth and let the teams um, work out what the details of all these things are. I'm not going to go through this in detail, by the way. Um, but what happened was they all decided to go in different directions. I gave them the architectural landscape, but not necessarily direction on what languages or what technologies to use. And actually, in the legacy stack, we had four languages. We had PHP, Angular, Python, and Go. And then the new stacks came along, and we ended up with even more. So we ended up with seven different languages. We're talking a team of 17 people. Um, imagine coming in to join, a, join an organization uh, as a new engineer, even if you're an experienced engineer. Actually, just out of, by way of curiosity, hands up uh, who has reasonable level of experience with every single one of those languages. I certainly didn't. I mean, I've, I've definitely written at least one line of code with all of them, but certainly not at, like, at scale or production level. So that's really challenging. I've been doing this for, as you saw from my previous slide, 20, 24 years. Um, so I realized at this point, the stack is actually the key mechanism or a key mechanism for alignment. So we go back to that, that original uh, quadrant. By choosing a technology framework and laying the guardrails for my team, I'm actually giving them an alignment. Uh, they can be autonomous within that. And that was a bit of a watershed moment for me. So I had to choose a language. Um, and believe you me, there was lots of debate. Um, there were folks who wanted to go with Ruby. There were folks who wanted to go with Go. There were, believe it or not, a handful that wanted to stick with PHP. 
Um, I guess PHP 7 and Laravel, eh, not so bad. Um, but we went with Elixir. And we went with Elixir for a multitude of reasons, but the one major reason is the one I want to focus on today. Probably if you're here at a functional programming uh, mini-conf, you're probably already sold, or maybe you're still becoming sold on the benefits of FP. Um, we certainly were, were conscious of those benefits. Um, it's, Elixir comes uh, from the Erlang ecosystem. So Erlang is a language that's been around for 30 years. It's um, a language that uh, powers uh, a huge amount of the telecommunications infrastructure in the world. It has incredibly high uh, concurrency and reliability systems built in. And then about 10 years ago, a guy called uh, Jose Valim came along and, and uh, wrote uh, a new syntax, a new grammar, using the Erlang virtual machine. That's the, the Beam virtual machine. Looked a little bit like Ruby. It was a lot more accessible to a broader audience than Erlang. If you've ever coded in Erlang, you realize it's, I mean, it's not to dis Haskell, but it's a similar sort of um, kind of curly syntax. Takes a little bit of time to get your head around it. And what we liked about Elixir was that it was kind of making it a bit more accessible to a broader audience, especially if you've come from um, Ruby. Um, and it has a great community. It has a good and growing uh, uh, support community. But on to the major reasons. One of the key problems we had when we had all these different systems, we had our legacy systems, we had now a growing set of new systems, um, gradually growing into Elixir, but we still had to support some of the Go services and so forth. Um, in order to orchestrate this for deployment and testing purposes, it really was like herding cats. It was an absolute cluster. Um, and in order for us to test an entire uh, workflow end to end, um, we had to deploy like five or six different things. So let me give you an example. This is a slightly contrived example. We'd probably want to break this down a bit more in practice. But as an example, as a new user, I can sign up to an existing company. That's a user story. So we would have to break that down into a handful of different things. Um, so we might need a new sign-up form, confirmation email, uh, a confirmation action to, to handle that, um, add the, the new user to the search index, yada, yada, yada. Um, in order for us to, to test that entire workflow uh, in a staging environment, um, we basically had to take all the different branches or the, or the open pull requests, if you like, to the different services uh, and then orchestrate them onto a single environment. Um, which, you know, things like Kubernetes and, and um, Docker Compose and so forth do help with that kind of stuff. But it's a lot of overhead. It's, it's cognitive effort. It's manual effort. It's a lot of extra complexity that we were trying to avoid. Um, so I was chatting to a friend of mine uh, who was involved in, in some of our strategy planning around this, a guy called Josh Price. Uh, if you've worked, if you know anything about the Elixir community, you've probably come across him. And he said to me, Dan, you should use a modular monolith. Like, what the F is a modular monolith? Modular I get, monolith I get, but modular monolith. Okay, so I said, am I paying this guy? Um, I was, actually, but it uh, took me a little while to realize what the hell he was on about. Um, and it's the thing that looks a little bit like this. This is a, a very simplified version of a, of a, a new architecture that we, um, we adopted. It's actually very new. There are still a, hand, there are a handful of um, companies out there that are, that are using this um, approach. But what it meant was that we could actually have multiple applications running within an application. So it would run as a monorepo, a single um, GitHub repository, or it was, sorry, was, was managed as a single GitHub repository. It could be deployed and run as a single deployable unit, or we could deploy little pieces of it. Um, so we broke it down into these ideas of bounded context. It's sort of trying to adhere to, to Conway's law, if you like, or some of the DDD concepts and domain-driven design. Um, and these application contexts were eff effectively ignorant of anything else around them. They had a particular job to do. Um, and then the, the uh, front-end stuff would connect via a router, which is just using a, a Phoenix plug, which is an um, Elixir framework. Um, and then using GraphQL, we would resolve the different queries to the different bounded contexts. So what did that mean we could do? Well, oh, this was just uh, showing you the, the repo, sorry. This was um, all the different uh, backend apps in, in GitHub. That's not that exciting. Um, firstly, there were some challenges before we get on to what it allowed us to do. There were some challenges. We had to let everybody, uh, had to give everyone enough time to uh, learn Elixir. That was challenging. Um, some folks had done a bit of FP before, so it wasn't so bad, but others not so. 
And the shift, if you've gone through this process, the shift from um, OO to FP can be challenging for many. Um, we realised that if we had a dependency, a particular version of a dependency, then that had to be the same throughout the entire monolith. So that meant that you sometimes had version clashes and, and that took a little bit of working out. Uh, as with any architectural design, working out the domain boundaries was challenging, working out what each bound of context should do. Um, and we still had some problems to solve around how do we handle shared databases and so forth. Um, we, we ended up, I, th I think, reasonably well solving all of those. So it looks something like this. Um, we actually still have a little bit of stuff to, to move in. We've got a couple of Ruby applications and we still have some of the legacy. Uh, it's, it's an application called Lovecraft. It's a, um, after HP Lovecraft. It's a PHP application um, uh, that needs to be moved into this. But all of the new stuff now sits inside this, this, um, this monolith. Um, so what does the, the review branch stuff look like now? Well, what this means is that we can orchestrate a single uh, broad sweeping cross-cutting feature in a single operation. So if we've made changes to several different uh, components in the context, including, say, front-end stuff, as the front-end stuff lives in the same monorepo, we can actually deploy it to a staging server in one go. And you can run the entire thing together. Um, this means that, that the QA processes, the development experience, the throughput of your development team is significantly improved. Um, services can also run on their own, which is an extremely important point, and I'll, I'll show you how this works in a moment. Um, if a developer is wanting to work on a specific context, they can run that context on its own. Um, if we want to deploy the whole thing together to test everything in unison, sort of like integration tests or whatever, then you can do the whole thing together. Um, of course, because it's Elixir, it's, it's concurrent. Uh, we have uh, the supervision trees that we get from the open telecommunications framework, or protocol, sorry, that um, you get in uh, uh, Erlang that keeps us, um, gives us a lot of uh, stability. Um, and the developers only need to learn two languages now. They only need to know two languages. So, and actually, in some cases, they only know Elixir or they only know JavaScript. But at least as a whole, there's only really two to, to worry about. Um, and this model will grow with our business. And I'll show you how that works in a moment. So this is what the future holds for Expert 360 now. This left-hand pane is what it might look like in dev. So let's say that we've got a, a profile service or a bounded context. And the dev might only need to be making changes to that one context. So they only need to run that one context. We do this using Docker containers, or they can run it directly on their machine if they want. Um, in staging, it doesn't have to handle any traffic. It doesn't have to worry about data sovereignty issues or anything like that. So we can spin the entire cluster up of all the different bounded contexts, of all the different databases, including some of the legacy stuff, all just on one service. And because Elixir is, um, uh, has very low memory footprint, you can actually just run that on a um, small or medium instance on Amazon, and the whole thing runs fine. But then in production, we can actually split the services from the monolith, the monolith up. The modulus, that's a, a new word I made up. Um, and then our clients can just hit GraphQL, and GraphQL knows how to resolve the query. So we can have a service running um, in, different, in a different region to deal with data sovereignty problems. Um, we can have multiple copies of one of the services if we're dealing with scalability problems. Um, and we know, because we've been able to run the whole thing in staging in as, as a single unit, um, we have some level of confidence that the whole thing's going to work. So when you've got a very large, complex, distributed system that's made up of, say, lots of microservices, testing that everything is going to work properly together is, is one of the, the key challenges. And so this was helping us address uh, those key challenges. Um, the other thing that's worth pointing out is that these uh, communications, say, from GraphQL to the services, can be done via one of two mechanisms, either HTTP or HTTPS, as you might imagine, um, but also through the um, Elixir internal um, process communications mechanism, um, which is uh, part of the, the OTP framework. Um, so it's much faster. It means that you have um, native type marshalling and so forth, um, and you don't have the overhead of, um, of setting up an HTTP connection. So um, that's a little bit about me. Before I finish up, I actually just wanted to give you a quick demo of what this looks like. So I actually have um, my... Um, Modular Monolith running at the moment. Um, 
might take a moment to start this up, but as you can see, I'm running inside this thing called the web root. So the web root is the thing that holds the whole thing together. Um, it's sort of a, uh, a, a the HTTP endpoint, but also where the GraphQL uh, service is, is run. Um, so I can start that up. Hopefully it doesn't recompile because that'll take a while and then you'll all be waiting. I shouldn't have stopped it, sorry. Talk amongst yourselves for a moment. There was one, uh, one big shift actually we all needed to make when we moved over to Elixir, which is going from an interpreted language like Ruby or PHP or even JavaScript um, over to a compiled language felt like um, we were going back to 10 years when I was working on, on Java or C++ stuff. Um, and it reminded me, did anyone ever see the, um, the XKCD joke when two guys are out on um, um, like twirly chairs playing swords and they're saying, oh, what are you guys doing? Oh, I'm coast compiling. Finally, again, that joke we can use. Okay, that started up. So what I wanted to show you was this thing called uh, Wobserver. It's, uh, Observer is a thing built into Erlang. Wobserver is just a web front end to that. And what it does is allows us to look at our supervision tree. So what that means is all the different applications that are running inside um, our uh, Elixir application. So if you go and have a look at the web root, for example, uh, this is uh, the behemoth. So I've actually decided for this example to run the entire uh, umbrella. Um, and if you scroll all the way down, you can see that this is the main process. Uh, we've got a, a supervisor process and then the endpoint, which is the HTTP um, endpoint. And then all of these other, it's a bit hard to kind of make it all out on this screen, um, but all the other different services that run within that different PIDs. Um, so it's orchestrating the entire thing. And the way the Elixir uh, supervisor tree works on the OTP model um, is that if any of those services uh, fail, they crash, they're basically automatically restarted. And then you can define different rules around how you want to restart it. Um, or if I wanted to, I could actually just uh, run, say, the profile service on, on its own, and I only have uh, five um, Elixir processes that need to run. So it makes development much, much more straightforward. I can, I can do test-driven development. I can run just the code I need to run in order to make uh, that particular part of the system work. Um, and if I want to test the whole thing together, I can, I can run the whole thing uh, quite easily as well. Um, and it might be interesting just to see uh, how much memory this thing uses. It's not very much, about 65 meg total memory. Obviously, it's going to have a user bit as it starts to marshal objects into memory, but Elixir has pretty good garbage collection. Um, and I have my, my graphical uh, GraphQL um, query interface here, which doesn't work on this size screen. And I can run queries, and I'm running that on, on my uh, modular monolith. So that's all I've got. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. And um, if you want to talk to me about this afterwards, we're more than happy to hang around. Thanks for your time. Cool. Oh, yeah, a few questions, if anyone's got some questions. I realise it's late in the day. you probably all got brain fade like I do. No? Cool. Clear as mud. <laughs>